Tonight, the human story behind small boats. As Channel crossings hit a record high, we speak to a family who risked their lives to reach Britain. We follow their journey from France to the UK and ask what drove them to spend thousands to get here. It's a difficult and dangerous journey that no one was expecting to survive. We were all thinking that our lives would end in a matter of seconds. At the heart of the problem, people smugglers from the Channel to the Mediterranean with little regard for human life. But what can be done to stop them and save lives? We'll debate the great migration problem with tonight's studio panel and our special correspondent, Alex Crawford. Also on the program, the Israeli military admits it fired at a building where two civilians died. It follows a Sky News investigation into an attack on an aid shelter in Gaza. Plus... Workers on the key bridge and then stop the outer loop. 213 dispatch, the whole bridge just fell down. Start started whoever everybody the whole bridge just collapsed the phone call trying to save lives as the baltimore bridge collapsed today the ship's data recorder was found how long before we know exactly what happened and the lawyer representing sean coombs also known as diddy hits out as police for raiding his home saying they showed military level force that's all coming up on the world with me yalda Hakim. Tonight, I want to start with the story of a family who risked it all to come to Britain. A family that, like so many others, got in a small boat and crossed the channel. Numbers out today showed that more than 4,500 people have made the journey this year alone. It's a record number for the first three months of a calendar year. Tonight, we're going to try to understand why numbers are surging once again, especially after the government pledged to stop the boats. You'll hear from one Kurdish family who spent more than £6,000 to make the journey. We previously spoke to them in France and today we met them here in the UK after what proved a harrowing journey through the middle of the night. So, was it worth it? For many migrants in the Channel or in the Mediterranean, it's a decision that can prove deadly. Last year, over 4,000 people drowned or went missing in the Med. The only ones really winning in all of this are people smugglers. And as conflicts rage across the globe and with more people displaced, governments clearly need to better plan to deal with this issue. So what can be done? More on that in a moment. But first, the family whose only hope was to come to Britain. They've been speaking to our Europe correspondent, Siobhan Robbins. In this hostel in France, the atmosphere is nervous. A father and his family are waiting for a call. A sign sea conditions are right. It's finally time to go. After fleeing from Kurdistan, this is what lies ahead. A potentially fatal crossing to the UK, provided by smugglers who value money over life. We don't have any other option except this dinghy. It's the surveillance for the trucks crossing the channel is very strong and that is why we have to take this journey. We will either die or succeed. To tell their story safely, they're in disguise and we've changed their names. The UK wasn't their destination of choice. For years, Germany was their home, but then their asylum bid failed and threatened with deportation. Last month, they ran again. What were you frightened would happen if you waited in Germany any longer? Um, I think uh, the police will be coming to my house and they will deport us to Iraq. So time had run out? The time had run out, yeah. Without warning, teenager Sara was ripped away from her friends and school. I really miss it. It's hard, right? I mean... I can go to school. I mean, sometimes I call with my friends, like... And every time they ask, uh, where are you? Are you safe? So this makes me pretty sad. Despite promises to stop the boats, a record number of migrants have crossed the channel this year. Last week, the family joined them, cramming into a rickety vessel with 60 others low on fuel and life jackets. In the dead of night, they left from this beach, but ended up drifting for hours when the engine gave out. 
It was a difficult and dangerous journey that no one was expecting to survive. We were all thinking that our lives would end in a matter of seconds. His fear is understandable. Nearly as many people have died trying to cross the channel in small boats this year as in the whole of 2023, a fact that makes the journey even more terrifying. Children, we had four, they were crying. So I was like, please, God, save us. And I was very scared to die. Now in the UK, they wait to hear their fate. Fresh threats of deportation or being sent to Rwanda weren't a deterrent. How does the UK stop people from coming on that route? You can't stop it. You can't stop it. This is smuggling and it will continue. This family hopes they can stay. It isn't a guarantee. And while the UK wasn't their first choice, they say it's their last hope. Siobhan Robbins, Sky News. Well, people attempting to cross seas are dying and in large numbers. On the 14th of January, five migrants died whilst attempting to cross the English Channel, travelling from France to the UK in January. The situation in the Mediterranean is worse. Last year, 4,110 people were killed or missing after getting into difficulty. The UN Refugee Agency estimates over 380 migrants have lost their lives crossing the Mediterranean so far this year. Let's bring in our special correspondent, Alex Crawford, who's covered the migrant crisis extensively. Alex, really good to see you. I mean, for years you've been covering, we've both covered these stories across the globe. Um, these images of desperate people getting into these dinghies, getting into these boats, it's all too familiar and, and it doesn't look like it's slowing down or it's been resolved in any way. Absolutely not. And they are shockingly familiar. Uh, I took a journey with many um, refugees, many immigrants who were trying to get over to Europe and specifically Britain nearly 10 years ago. In 2015, uh, we joined uh, a group, a, a whole load of people who first in Turkey, who were uh, going through checkpoints. It was very much an industry, a business. They bought life jackets. They, uh, in, in the, the, uh, the Turkish border towns, uh, coastal towns. They then got in touch with smugglers. There were a number of them. They had, they'd already made contact on Facebook pages and through social media. They then joined this, this factory line of people. We, we were all sorted into groups as though you were boarding ferries like you might do um, you know, in, at Dover to get over to France, except these were illegal. Uh, boat uh, groups and the the, the uh, person who was put in charge of driving the dinghy had never done it before. So the very first time we set off, it didn't work, and we we went back to to shore again. And then they tried again. And whilst we were crossing over from Turkey to uh, Greece, the Greek coast guard tried to um, deter them from getting into Greek waters by trying to push. Um, you know, swell the waters to try and tip the boat over and then fired live um, guns in the air. The, the people on board the dinghy held up their, their babies to show that there were babies on board. The men sat around the, the edges of the, of the dinghy. The women and the children were all uh, down in the body of, of the dinghy. And it, to me, it looked very much like a business. It is a business and that business has grown. A lot of these people had come from uh, sub-Sahara areas um, from very, very poor areas or war-torn areas. On board the dinghy that, that I was on board with, with my camera crew, Gowan McClucky, the man directly opposite me was a Syrian surgeon, a heart surgeon who'd fled the war in Syria. So these are people who, to me, appeared to be extremely desperate, absolutely felt they had no other choice and had already made a huge long journey just to get to that point of crossing from Turkey to Greece. Yeah, and a Alex, you know, it's extraordinary you say this was 10 years ago. Of course, we, we'd labelled it then the, the migrant crisis with, with so many people um, on the move. 
And there were all sorts of pledges made at the time by governments here in Europe that they would try and figure it out, throw money at the situation, try and resolve the issues at in home country in places like Syria. Almost 10 years on, nothing seems to have changed. And as you say, this is a business. These people are bought and sold. And the only people profiteering from this are the people smugglers. Yeah, and there's all sorts of different levels of people smugglers. There are huge, big, like, mafia-type gangs that are running this, and also individuals. I met one of them and interviewed one of them in Turkey who was doing it, he felt, as a sort of help. <laughs> so he would facilitate helping get these people a lifeline to a better life. But then you have these big groups who are doing it with absolutely no regard for... Uh, any of the people or their lives or the children are just making money out of it. And then there is another level where um, actual, there is a level of corruption in institutionalized within a number of the different countries through which all these refugees and migrants pass through. And it was interesting, I was reading a US State Department report, which only came out last year, which talks about Libya being one of the top for a number of years, worst offenders of this. Libya itself is in virtual anarchy. It's got a very splintered, fractured two party, two sort of authorities running different parts of the country. They have a very lax infrastructure. It's uh, not very well backed up inside the country or outside the country. And there are a lot of profiteers within all parts of the country who are benefiting from this. We went into you know, many years ago now, but into the various detention centres, because when some of these migrants or refugees are caught as they're making their way through, they're very vulnerable to corruption. They're seized by um, the the state-run uh, institutions and also criminal gangs, and they're held in detention centres that are sometimes part of the uh, Libyan authority infrastructure, but also that are sort of laws unto themselves. And within those centers, there is basically a, a lot of brutality, a lot of poverty, desperation. There's multiple uh, reports of rape, constant ones that are still ongoing now. And to get out of those detention centers, you have, your, your, you have to beg your family in various parts of the world to pay a fee. You have to bribe the uh, officials, or in some cases, we heard that um, you know uh, extremist groups like ISIS would come and break into the prison and offer them a chance of joining ISIS and getting free, or staying behind perhaps to face more brutality for weeks, months, who, who knows how long. So the system is extremely fractured, extremely corrupt. It's very difficult to see a way through stopping this trail of migrants and refugees because the the source of it the the real problem in all these different countries which could be caused by you know extreme poverty extreme climate change which is making them flee their countries or war in many many cases war and corrupt governments and persecution that isn't being sorted so yeah. it's it's lent it's opened up a vacuum and a business for criminal gangs individuals governments to profit from. Yeah, Alex, uh, thank you so much. We're really grateful um, for all of your analysis and background uh, on, on the um, migration crisis that we continue to face. Thank you very much. Now, with me here in the studio tonight, global correspondent at the I, Molly Blackall, and Jasmine El Gamal, political analyst and former Middle East advisor at the US Department of Defense. Thank you both uh, for joining us here on the program. And Molly, you spent time in, in Calais, in the Mediterranean, everything Alex was saying there, I mean, these are stories I've also covered on the ground. You mm. see the kind of business that this is, that these people get passed on from one group to another, bought and sold, they're vulnerable the entire time, and they face death at the end of it. Mm. I think that's what a lot of people forget in the discourse that we have around it here in the UK, which for many people is the final destination on what's actually a very, very long journey. You know, many people have been on the move for three, four years. Um, and I've met people, as you say, at each stage. We've been out in the Mediterranean, which is what the UN describes as the deadliest migration route in the world, and um, particularly that area crossing from um, Libya to Italy, um, and then covering things in the channel. Um, and at each stage, you know, people have been through several countries, 
They've often, often taken several different routes. Many, like Alex was describing, have spent time in detention centres in Libya, which are known for their brutality. Um, so it's actually the culmination of a very long journey. And I think often people forget that people are usually fleeing something as well as just moving towards something else. And Jasmine, yet governments do need policies to curb this, to deal with it. It's just a, a question of what we do find is a lot of rhetoric, very little action in trying to resolve this and also deal with the people smugglers, the desperation and trying to deal with the problems in source country. Yeah, you took the words right out of my mouth when you said policy. Obviously, every government is going to have to deal with people coming into the country through means that are not legal, so through the channel crossing, for example. Um, that's not unique. Of course, the government is worried about what to do with people. The UK government has tons of issues that they're struggling with at home, the NHS, mental health, you know, all of these really important issues. But the fact is that in order to start preparing and thinking through sound policies, you have to think of the people as people first. You can't think of them as problems. The way that most governments talk about refugees and asylum seekers, it's almost like they lose their identities as human beings the minute they get on they that boat. They become numbers. They become they? numbers, they become invaders, they become people who are coming to take your job. But in reality, they are people who are traumatized, they are desperate, they are often fleeing war, horrific conditions. Um, they have already spent years sometimes, as you said, Molly, on this treacherous journey. I spent, I think it was in 2015 or 2016, 10 days at a refugee camp in Greece with ref Syrian refugees and Afghan refugees who were trying to make their way mostly to Germany. And I'll never forget this one woman, this older woman who hadn't been able to shower or use any kind of water to clean herself in about three or four days. And she was crying in front of me and saying, I'm too ashamed to pray. I mean, that is the level of trauma that people, and yet they continue because they know that they have to. And so if the government, and talking about this government in particular now, in order to come up with sound policies that they can sell to the British people, you have to first start with treating this problem not as a problem of numbers, but as a problem of fellow human beings, talking about it with empathy, explaining what these people have been through and explaining the need for all of us in this country together to work together to try to help them find a better life, whether it's here or somewhere else. Jasmine, Molly, we're gonna keep you right here uh, for our next segment. Uh, we will be back after this break. You're watching The World with me, Yalda Hakim. Our investigation into the attack on an aid shelter in Gaza prompted the IDF to respond. I'll be joined by our data and forensics correspondent, Tom Cheshire, who has been taking an in-depth look at what happened. Stay with us for that. Crawford and I'm Sky's special correspondent based in Istanbul. This is going to be the biggest party Tripoli has ever seen. That's it. it, it got us then. There's a lot of action going on, a lot of hits still. We aim to be the best and the most trusted place in news. This is the cocktail of drugs which the doctors at this hospital have been giving their coronavirus patients. Made for people who want clarity in an uncertain world. Mother Nature is, can be vicious, absolutely savage. The world's largest falls now down to a trickle in places. I can't imagine 
how much plastic is lying at the bottom of this huge lake. Whoa! <laughs> close and personal with the rhino. This is what makes the job so fun. Welcome back. Next, some major questions for the Israeli military and concerns about the safety of those spaces where civilians are seeking refuge. That's because the Israeli military has admitted it fired at a building where two civilians died following a Sky News investigation into an attack on an aid shelter in Gaza. Several others uh, were injured in the incident, all family members of staff working for Médecins Sans Frontières. Sky News' data and forensics unit pieced together how the event unfolded using exclusive video of the immediate aftermath of the event, as well as photos and witness accounts. It begs the question if an aid shelter belonging to MSF could be hit is anywhere safe in Gaza. Tom Cheshire has this report. The tank shell has ignited a gas canister. Be careful of the gas cylinder, he says. It's going to blow up. They don't have much time, and two people are already dead. Whose wife is this, he asked. Come, let's get her out. Pull, pull. This video, obtained exclusively by Sky News, shows the immediate aftermath of an attack on an aid shelter in Gaza. Two women were killed. Seven people were injured, including twin babies and two teenage girls whose faces were badly burned. All but one were from the same family. We've analysed troves of imagery, spoke to witnesses and teamed up with weapons experts to study the blast damage and piece together how the incident unfolded. In response to our investigation, the Israeli military has now admitted that it did fire at a building where, it says, terror activity was occurring and that civilians were killed. And that could be a war crime, because it was clearly occupied by the international aid group Médecins Sans Frontières, or MSF. It's in a sparsely populated area in Al Mawasi in southern Gaza. More than 60 people, including aid workers and their families, were sheltering in the building when it was hit. We couldn't independently verify exactly where the projectile was fired from, but witnesses told us the tanks came from the south and drove up north. Damage on the building showed the shelter was hit on its southern side. Here we can see clearly that it went through a first floor window. We put our findings to weapons analysts to understand what the damage can tell us about the attack. They said that whatever came through the window detonated as it hit the ceiling or exploded just below. The impact on the wall next to the window suggests it was blown outwards. One munitions expert said the damage is consistent with that of a tank shell. A collection of fragments was found in the room the projectile was fired into. Our analysts confirm these are clearly fragments from the body of a high-caliber tank shell. One of the witnesses nearby when the attack happened said he saw a big light appear when the building was first hit and heard gunfire. 
Tanks driving by left a cloud of dust in their wake. MSF told us that Israeli authorities knew of the shelter's whereabouts. We notified the GPS coordinates to the Israeli army to say this is a medical structure. Israel has uh, reconfirmed that they had the coordinates of this building. We put all those allegations to the IDF, who gave us this statement. During operational activity in Han Yunus, the IDF forces fired at a building that was identified as a building where terror activity is occurring. After the incident, reports were received of the death of two uninvolved civilians in the area. The IDF regrets any harm to civilians and does everything in its power to operate in a precise and accurate manner in the combat field. The IDF has said they are conducting their own investigation into the incident. Legal experts have told us that hospitals and medical facilities have protections under international humanitarian law. They're presumed to be civilian objects unless there's a proven military objective. There are a number of questions that are going to have to be asked. Did they, in fact, have a legitimate military objective? What was the intelligence that they had, if any, that this was being used for military purposes? If they didn't have that information, if then it isn't a legitimate military objective. And then if they're intentionally targeting a civilian object, in particular a civilian object that's being used by medical personnel, that is a violation of the Geneva Conventions and potentially a war crime. MSF says it's committed to staying and continuing its work in Gaza. The shelter has been evacuated and staff have relocated. But if this building, known to the IDF, clearly marked and relatively isolated, wasn't safe, it's hard to think where else possibly could be. And Tom joins me here in the studio now. Tom, really important investigation there. And we got a rare concession from the IDF. Yeah, it, it is rare to get it, and it was couched in specific language, but they said they are investigating the incident themselves. This is an arm's length body doing it, and that arm's length body is for exceptional events, as they put it. Um, especially that idea of terror activity is very, very vague. A lot of the time when we have had uh, specific instances, they've mentioned things like Hamas militants or said exactly what was going on. Terror activity is quite vague, and I think it's also worth reminding that there is a burden on proof if you listen to... Uh, Karim Khan, who's the prosecutor for the ICC, the International Criminal Court, who, who says, you know, the burden of proof, if, if a building is losing protected status, which schools, any civilian building has, it doesn't necessarily have to be a hospital or uh, this wasn't a medical facility, it was a shelter, but they have to show why it's lost that medical, uh, why that it's lost that protected status. The burden of proof is on them. It's also worth mentioning, saying they are looking at all crimes committed, including the October the 7th uh, attacks as well, so this is going to be all-encompassing. But investigations like these where you sort of, you try and get as much of this evidence as you can. That is all going to be poured over in future. And a lot of those decisions will have to be justified one way or the other. Tom, uh, thank you so much for, as I said, that very um, important investigation. I'm joined now by Dr. Hassan Abu Sita, a plastic and reconstructive surgeon who spent over a month in operating theatres during Israel's offensive uh, in Gaza City. Thank you so much, Doctor, for joining us here on the programme. I know you've seen uh, Tom's investigation there. Just your reaction to it. I think we need to first remember that Mawasi is one of the areas that the Israelis had at the big outset of the war said would be a safe area and one of the places that Palestinian civilians leaving the north need to be heading towards. And two, that this is the second, as someone who worked as a volunteer for, with MSF, this is the second MSF uh, uh, facility that was targeted. Previously, the uh, limb reconstruction unit at Lauda Hospital in Jabalia was hit by an Israeli missile and three of the MSF doctors were killed there. Um, and so this is part of the pattern and that pattern is to dismantle and destroy the Palestinian health system um, and to emphasize impunity in the process. Yeah, um, Doctor, as we've said, and as Tom was saying there, the IDF has said that they have launched an investigation into this and are looking into it. But as we've been reporting, you were in Gaza for almost 50 days and you saw firsthand the devastation, especially uh, to the children that this war has caused. Half of the wounded in Gaza um, are, were children and continue to be children. And now, with the starvation happening in the north, we are adding yet another mechanism of death to this genocidal war. And we're watching kids die of malnutrition uh, um, in the north. 
um, in addition to the, the lives that have been taken, there are children, thousands of children, who've had amputations. And these are lives that have been damaged and destroyed. And these kids have been consigned to a lifelong trajectory of repeated surgeries, some up to 12 surgeries by the time they're adults in children who've had lower limb amputations in war. Yeah, I, I mean, I guess we often talk about the, the death toll and the number of orphans in this conflict. Uh, we don't necessarily focus on those who have survived, but will deal with uh, the implications of this conflict for the rest of their lives. Absolutely. Uh, uh, the medical literature is very clear when they've looked at the consequences of war-related injuries in children. It literally is a lifelong... Uh, um, a process in which as the body of this child grows, the injured part, which is left fibrotic and scarred, is unable to grow at the same rate. And so they go back to surgery over and over again because the disability happens as their bodies try to grow. And we see that most clearly in children with amputations. Kids with amputations need a new prosthetic every six months and they need surgery repeatedly. And, Doctor, I just wanted to come to that point. As you say, they need, um, you know, surgery uh, regularly. Given the state in which Gaza is today and the level of destruction, what will happen to these children? Because they can't all be taken out of Gaza for these uh, operations. Do you, are you hopeful that, that once this conflict comes to an end that these children can be tended to? So the Israelis, what they have done is that they've systematically destroyed and dismantled the health system. And tonight I got a, an, a photo from one of my colleagues who was at Shifa Hospital showing the way the Israeli soldiers have torched the buildings of Shifa Hospital as they're withdrawing. And so unless there is an immediate ceasefire and there is a, an injection of a large number of field hospitals that will compensate for the destroyed health system and allow the treatment of, as you said, some of these children who cannot be taken out of Gaza. These children will eventually die of their wounds. These wounds become infected. These children then become septic and they die. Or what we have is injuries that were previously reconstructable become permanent disabilities or permanent disabilities becoming much worse as a result of the delay in getting treatment. Dr. Hassan, we're grateful for your time. Thank you very much for joining us. Now, let's bring in our global correspondent at the I, Molly Blackall, and Jasmine El Gamal, political analyst and former Middle East advisor at the US Department of Defense. Thank you both for joining us here uh, on uh, the program. Um, we continue the conversation. I mean, we're five months into this uh, conflict now, Jasmine, and um, you saw our investigation there and, and what Dr. Hassan said, just your reaction. Mm -hmm. You know, I think when I was when I was looking at this earlier, I was thinking this is really a microcosm of the biggest problem or one of the biggest issues of this conflict is that we actually don't, as outsiders, have any independent verification, any um, uh, idea of what is really happening inside of Gaza. I mean, we have what the IDF is saying. Funny enough, the most uh, rampant kind of documentation is coming out of IDF soldiers on TikTok when they're filming their videos and saying, here's what I did, here's the building I blew up, you know, whatever. Um, but we don't have a robust kind of movement back and forth in and out of journalists um, from, from the West, from the Middle East, from all these other places to really try to verify what the IDF says when it says that it's bombed a building because there was a Hamas operative there or because there was Hamas activity there. What does that really mean? We don't know. We can't get that information because people aren't allowed to go in and verify. People like Dr. Hassan are some of the closest and most credible witnesses we have because, A, he's been there, but also now he gets information from people inside. But otherwise, there remains this huge issue of independent verification of IDF claims. And this is just the latest example that we're talking about today. Yeah, I mean, we did the investigation here at Sky News of that one MSF shelter, but it's it's difficult to know really what's going on on the ground going into the sixth month of, of this conflict as we wait to hear of news of, of some kind of ceasefire. 
Yeah, absolutely. As Jasmine says, you know, information is so difficult. Even, you know, things like the death toll, the casualty figures, all we have from that is, is the Hamas-run uh, Palestinian health ministry. So even that, it's very difficult to know actually what the scale of this problem is. Certainly from aid organisations who I'm in contact with on the ground, you know, the picture is... is is properly dire. Um, I think it was um, the International Rescue Committee at the start of this month said that only 12 of Gaza's 36 hospitals are even partially functioning now. Um, and this issue of aid workers um, and, you know, more broadly civilians being caught up in this violence is something that we've seen from the off. You know, the Palestinian Red Crescent, for instance, has reported many dead among its paramedics um, when they've gone in uh, to try to help people. Um, and certainly Israel argues that it's only targeting at legitimate military targets but certainly in an area which now, particularly in the south, is so overcrowded and which has always been fought in civilian areas, um, it's extremely difficult to differentiate at this point between what is a military target and what is a group of civilians. Yeah, and I guess, you know, what Dr Hassan was saying there, that hospitals have become the, the front line of this conflict. We've seen so many hospitals where the IDF, um, the Israelis, have said that Hamas are operating. We saw the, the operations that took place in, in Al-Shifa. And then on the other hand, you know, we have doctors like Dr Hassan who say the situation was devastating, I didn't see any Hamas operatives here. So we're just getting conflicting reports across the board. There are uh, a couple of different issues when it comes to that. I mean, one, there's a question of, well, even if there was a Hamas operative there, did you still have to go in and destroy the entire hospital and torch it as you were leaving so that it's actually destroyed and can't be used in the future? And so... This is the issue with the IDF response in Gaza over the last several months, is that there have been degrees of potential and possible reactions, and they just always take it to the extreme level. They don't just go in and try to extract the Hamas official or operative if they are, in fact, in the hospital. They will destroy the entire hospital, and they will make sure that you can't use it again. So these are... Um, uh, unfortunately, we've seen this type of these types of attacks before. This is not the first conflict where you've had a country go in and and attack hospitals and ambulances. We saw it in Syria with the Russians. We saw it in Ukraine. It's something that happens again and again. Except, I mean, of the, course, the this time have continued to say that what they're doing are, are targeted strikes. Of course, they're saying that. I mean, that goes back to what we were saying earlier. Is we have what the IDF is saying and we have what we are getting from eyewitnesses on the ground, and there's no independent verification to go in Jones and actually yeah. see what is going on. If the IDF was so sure, and this is what people have been saying over and over, if you're so sure that you aren't doing anything wrong, that you are only doing self-defense, that you are only targeting uh, uh, Hamas operatives, <clears throat> let us in. Let us see what's happening so that we can let the rest of the world know. That remains a huge problem. Yeah. There's no independent verification of what the IDF yeah, is doing. doing. Jasmine, Molly, thank you both for joining us here on the program. This is The World with me, Yalda Hakim. After the break, what led to the collapse of Baltimore's longest bridge will cross live to the city where the governor of Maryland is expected to give an update.
Welcome back. The data recorder from the container ship that brought down the Baltimore Bridge has now been recovered. Six people are presumed dead after the structure fell, as well as the question of the vessel's condition. Authorities investigating what happened say they will also focus on how and why the bridge collapsed so quickly. Our US correspondent Martha Kellner reports now from Baltimore. It's a grim day for the grimmest of missions. Specialist divers now in these waters searching for the bodies of six men still missing, presumed dead. Among them, 49-year-old Miguel Luna, a father of six, originally from Mexico, and Maynor Suazo, a 37-year-old father of two. His sister says he was the driving force of their family. Es lo mejor. I think he was the best brother ever. He gave us strength for everything. I only ask that God finds him. That's all we ask. 18 hours into the search as the rescue operation became recovery, the ship's black box was found. Investigators hope it will help determine what caused this tragedy. I need one of you guys on the south side, one of you guys Police on the audio south from the side, minutes before the disaster the reveals the efforts to try and shut the bridge after the ship crew issued a frantic Mayday call. Uh, there's a ship approaching that just lost their steering. So until you get that under control, we got to stop all traffic. Yeah, if we can stop traffic, just make sure no one's on the bridge right now. I said to myself, why is that? Why is the boat right there? As police raced to close the bridge, Terry, on her way back from work, was still on it. I got to the bottom at exactly 129, and I heard an explosion, and I thought maybe I blew a tire. And um, when I looked back, I seen the bridge collapsing. You saw the construction workers? Though. I did see them. I, I hurried up and went past them. You must have been one of the last people to see them alive. Yeah, I was. I'm really in shock. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm devastated. I'm in shock. I feel sad for the family. Um, it could have been me. It's a treacherous mission for the divers searching for the missing in these waters. Not only are conditions changeable, visibility beneath the surface is almost zero, and they're having to avoid the mangled metal and debris from the bridge and the ship. They're being watched all the time by the crew of 22 aboard the Dali, stranded on the vessel until it can be moved. Uh, Andrew, how long is the crew likely to be stuck on that ship for? I, I'm going to venture to say at least several weeks. Andrew is acting as a liaison officer for the crew. I was actually just messaging with uh, one of the crew now and... Um, they're expressing, you know, expressing the need for communication. So, you know, my, my response was, I'll work on it and I'll biggest, the, the biggest hurdle will be getting it out to them while they're still sitting in the river. Even after this cargo ship can be transported, the White House warned of a long and difficult path to full recovery for Baltimore. For those who have lost loved ones, it won't be that easy. And Martha joins me now live from the scene. Uh, Martha, a, a difficult sort of 24, 36 hours um, for Baltimore. Um, but we do know that that data recorder has been retrieved and we should have more information on that in the next few hours. Yeah, this data recorder, Yalda, is known as a, a black box. It's similar to a black box on an aeroplane. It shows uh, the speed of the travel of, of that boat. It also shows the direction of travel and whether there were any issues with the essential functions of that boat. And that we know that there were issues with the power because of first-hand accounts of lights going on and off. And, of course, that mayday call from the crew which warned of impending disaster here. Now, the body leading this investigation is the Na National Transportation Safety Board. We know that investigators were able to get on board uh, this ship for the first time yesterday evening to retrieve that data recorder, but also to record uh, what they call perishable elements of this investigation. So pictures uh, of the boat's structure, documents that might be left on board, things that might be damaged over the course of time. The chair of the NTSB, Jennifer Homendy, uh, she says that they may be able to release the findings from that black box, from that data recorder, within a matter of hours. She says it could be key in working out what happened here, what caused uh, this incredible 
tragedy, but she says it may yet be too soon to work out exactly why it happened. OK, uh, Martha, thank you so much for that update. And um, we know that the authorities are preparing to hold a press conference to bring us up to date on the latest situation. Uh, so we will be bringing that to you on Sky News as soon as it happens. Now, uh, let's just bring you some breaking news and stay in the United States uh, because we understand four people have been killed and five wounded in a stabbing attack in northern Illinois and a suspect is believed to be in custody. Um, police have said uh, that uh, we have a suspect in custody who's being interviewed at this time. We don't believe there's any other suspects that are on the run or at large at this particular time. And uh, they say that um, there are four people who were killed and five are wounded wounded in the stabbing um, and that she said one one person remains in critical condition. So that's a stabbing incident in northern Illinois um, and we understand that four people were killed and five were wounded uh, with the suspect in custody. Well, uh, let's uh, move on to the rest of the day's news and uh, he's gone by many names, P. Diddy and Puff Daddy to name a few. But why have police in America raided the homes of rapper and record producer Sean uh, Diddy Coombs? We're joining me now live from LA, civil rights attorney Ariva Martin. Ariva, thanks very much uh, for joining us here on the program. Um, P. Diddy's lawyers say that this was a gross overuse of military level force, these raids. Do they come as a surprise to you, though? The raids aren't a surprise when you think about the seriousness of the allegations that are contained in the four civil complaints. I do agree that the militarized response that we saw, particularly at his home in Los Angeles, seemed like overkill, didn't seem to be warranted given that uh, there are no allegations that, uh, at least at this point, that we are aware of that there would be any harm done to officers that were serving uh, the search warrant at his home. Uh, so I, I do have concerns about how the search warrants were executed. But the reality is the, the charges that have been made in these civil suits are very alarming. They're horrifying. Charges or accusations, I should say, of rape, of uh, giving drugs and alcohol to underage girls, to human trafficking, uh, to even being involved with a shooting that was later covered up. So there are some very serious allegations. As you allegations. say, I mean, so, some of these allegations incredibly um, serious and that these raids have really turned up the, the legal heat on Diddy. Oh, no doubt about it. No doubt about it. At first, we were looking at what appeared to just be civil complaints. But when Homeland Security raids your home with a search warrant, we now know and from reports that there are uh, some investigations happening in New York City and these investigations are criminal. His, he and his lawyers have pushed back and said that they will do whatever they can uh, to, to clear his name. I mean, no surprises there that that's what he's going to say. No surprises. And we haven't seen that yet. We saw with the Cassie uh, lawsuit that was filed by his ex-girlfriend, Cassandra Ventura, it was settled uh, one day after it was filed. So we've yet to see uh, P. Diddy go into a courtroom to defend himself against these kinds of allegations. Now, clearly, uh, he may decide to do that with respect to these three other civil suits, uh, but it remains to be seen. So far, we've just heard his lawyers push back, but we have not seen or any evidence to suggest that these allegations are false. Um, Reva, just tell us a little bit more about what his girlfriend, Cassie, has accused him of. As you say, yeah. that, that case was, was settled. Yes, uh, very, very disturbing allegations in Cassie's lawsuit, uh, allegations including uh, that she was lured uh, into a relationship with him, uh, that she felt uh, psychologically bound to him, that he forced her to have sex with men that he would bring into uh, the home where they were, and that he would watch her as she had sex with uh, other men, that he uh, physically abused her, hit her, kicked her, uh, and you know engaged in actual sexual uh, assault uh, and sexually assaulted her as well. Uh, and she said this conduct went on for many, many years. Um, Ariva, I mean, however this uh, all evolves, it certainly does threaten his legacy and, and his business empire, given he is one of the most prominent um, people, you know, from the 90s right through to now when it comes to hip hop. 
Yeah, there's some allegations that he's already taken a hit with respect to his various business ventures. Uh, there was an article out this morning in the New York Times that says that many of the top executives that worked uh, for his company, for his various brands, have left. Uh, we know, even if you look at social media, we haven't seen, uh, you know, other high-profile celebrities, other high-profile rap artists, other high-profile entrepreneurs coming to his rescue. In fact, the entertainment world is, is pretty quiet about these allegations. Uh, so no doubt he suffered tremendous reputational harm as a result of these allegations. And if there does continue to be some type of criminal uh, investigation related to some of these charges, I suspect we'll see uh, even more people uh, walk away from him. Yeah, I mean, we've seen this in other cases, haven't we? Regardless of how these cases evolve, people do tend to, to then distance themselves from, from these very high-profile stars. Absolutely. At the end of the day, people are self-interested, right? And if you are a business person, the last thing you want to do uh, is be in business with someone who has been accused of a sexual assault, and particularly in this case because there are allegations involving underage girls. Uh, and no matter what people think about the Me Too movement or uh, you know any of the other allegations, I think everyone can agree that if an adult male is having sex with or in any way exploiting underage girls, that is just bad news for your business brand. So uh, we should expect to see, as I said, if these allegations continue, if an investigation continues, uh, I cannot imagine that any of his companies survive or that any of his business associates uh, will continue to be in business with him. Ariva, we're really grateful uh, for your time. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Now, we should stress that Diddy's team insists he is innocent and will continue to fight to clear his name. Well, that's all for tonight's program. The News at 10 is next with more on the dangerous journey across the channel and further updates on the Baltimore Bridge collapse. Martha will be joining uh, the team at the News at 10 for an update on that. We're back tomorrow at 9pm. For now, good night.